Okay, so in this video, we're going to go over some of the features of life. What do all, what are some characteristics that all life has in common? So let's go ahead and get started. So when we talk about features of life, well, that leads us to discussing what is biology. And you may have heard of the definition, biology is the study of life, but it's not quite that simple. We study a lot more than just living things in biology, first of all. I want to mention where we find life. Life exists in a very thin layer of Earth known as the biosphere. When you look at this picture right here, you know there's no life as far as we know in the inner core or the outer core or the mantle. And even uh, when you look at the crust, we find life in a very thin layer of the crust known as the biosphere. If we kind of highlight this area of the picture and zoom on in, when we do, we can see here is the biosphere. It ranges from about 8,000 meters above sea level to about 10,000 meters below sea level. That is where we find life. 8,000 meters above sea level is about the height of Mount Everest. 10,000 meters below sea level is about the depth of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the, of the ocean. In that area of earth is where in that area of the crust excuse me is where we find life that area is known as the biosphere and so what we know is today studying life that there's over two million known species that are alive on earth today when you look at this picture here here we have the six big broad kingdoms or categories of life if something is alive on earth it's placed in one of these six categories so you recognize, again, uh, there's some flowers right there, symbolic of plants. There's a dog right there, symbolic of the animal kingdom. There's a mushroom right there, symbolic of the fungus kingdom. There's a one-celled amoeba right there, symbolic of the protista kingdom. Here's some colorful bacteria in the eubacteria kingdom. And here's some other bacteria in the archaebacteria kingdom. But we know that there's over two million known species and they all live within what's called the biosphere. And when we find what we, the pattern that we see here is that if you look at kind of this picture of the earth and the highlighted flashing yellow area represents the area along the equator where we most find life. Well, there's a pretty simple reason why we find more life along the equator. Uh, warmer temperatures, moist environments, plenty of water. And so on Earth, you know, nice, comfortable, warm environment, plenty of sunlight, plenty of moisture. That, those are the conditions for life here on Earth. And one thing we know when we study biology is that there's over 2 million known species. I brought that up a moment ago, but what is a species? Species are organisms that can create fertile offspring. Here we have a drawing of a man and a woman. Man and woman are, are excuse me, a man and woman are the same species. You take a, uh, a random male and a random female, and when you analyze their DNA, we find that humans, completely unrelated humans, are nearly identical on the genetic DNA level. And so because male and female DNA is almost identical, yeah, they can create a, a human being, a baby. They're the same species. But when we look at this picture, are centaurs possible? If you know your Greek mythology, it's an organism that's half human and half horse. Are these possible? Can a human and a horse breed and reproduce with one another? Well, I hope you know the answer to that question is no. Humans and horses are different species. Our DNA and horse DNA is too different. What about a chimpanzee? You might know that a chimpanzee is the closest living relative to humans on planet Earth. And it says, humans and chimps, we are over 98% identical. When you examine the DNA of a human and a chimp, the DNA is about over 98% identical. Can we reproduce with each other? Can a human and a chimpanzee reproduce and breed and make a hybrid baby? I hope you know the answer is no. Even though we're over 98% identical, we're just not identical enough. We are different species. So when you go back to the picture of the human and the, the male human and the male uh, and the female human, the drawing a moment ago, the reason 
that a male and a female human can reproduce is they're the same species. Their DNA is very similar to one another. And from what we can tell is that the oldest life on Earth, which are thought to be bacteria, uh, they existed around three and a half billion years ago. In the picture, these are called stromatolites, and these are rock formations that accumulate because of the actions of a bacteria known as cyanobacteria. And these stromatolites are some of the oldest evidence for life on Earth. We find, uh, and when we use radiometric dating, we find these to be about three and a half billion years old. So clearly life is very, very ancient compared to uh, humans. Humans uh, are maybe only 150, 200,000 years old in the evolutionary course of time. So that definition, biology is the study of life, does that mean that polar bears, are they a part of biology? Yes, of course, they're living organisms. Plants, are plants a part of biology? Yes, of course, they are living organisms. Bacteria, are bacteria a part of biology? Study of life, of course, bacteria are living organisms. But here's where the definition gets a little cloudy. Bi biology is the study of life. Mountains, are they a part of biology? You might say no, because mountains aren't alive, but absolutely, mountains are very much a part of biological studies because life inhabits the mountains. The sun, is the sun a part of biology? Biology is the de definition is the, the, the study of life. Is the sun a, st a part of biology? Is the sun a part of biological studies? You might say no, the sun's not alive, but life depends on the sun. Life is very important for photosynth photosynthesis to occur. So yes, the sun is a part of biology. Water. So when you look at the definition, biology is the study of life. Well, water is not alive, but do we study water as we try to expand our understanding of biology? And I hope you, you see the pattern here is yes, absolutely. Even though water is not alive, living things inhabit the water. Living things need water to drink to survive. And last one of these examples here. Are molecules a part of biology? You probably know molecules are part of chemistry. Are they a part of biology as well? Molecules are not alive. But yes, they are a part of biology because molecules, such as the animation in the picture, that's a DNA molecule. Molecules are very important in understanding how life and cells work. So the definition of biology is the study of life, it's not always so cut and dry. So when we look at life characteristics, all life has a few common characteristics. And if we were in class, I would have you turn to your neighbor and try to discuss what are some of the characteristics that all life on Earth has, and then have you, of course, share your thoughts. But let's go ahead and just move on with this, if you're watching at home. So one of the things that all life has in common, all life, whether it's the simplest form of life, such as bacteria, to the most complex organisms, which we like to think are humans, well, all life has uh, at least one cell. A cell is the most basic unit of life capable of carrying on life processes. And so one thing that we've learned over the time is that cells over time have become specialized to perform certain duties. In the picture, you see red blood cells. You might know that the function of a red blood cell is to carry oxygen. Well, here's another picture. Here's a white blood cell. You might know the function of white blood cells are to help fight infection, help fight off bacteria and virus invaders. 
Here's a, a, a nerve cell, a neuron, which is another name for a nerve cell. You might know that the job or the function of a neuron, a nerve cell, is to send electrical signals to and from the brain. So cells have become very specialized over time. Another characteristic for all life, all life requires energy. Energy is simply defined as the ability to do work or cause change. Now, life, when it takes in food, has the ability to break down materials, and that's what we call an organism's metabolism. Well, in the picture, here we're going to have an example of breaking down food. Here we have a young lady. She's about to eat a hamburger, and as she eats the hamburger, it goes into her stomach. And of course, once it's in the stomach, it is slowly digested and broken down. Well, after exiting the stomach, you can see the, the bits and pieces of what used to be the hamburger exited the stomach and have now moved into the woman's small intestines. Once your food moves into the small intestines, again, we're looking at metabolism, the ability to break down material. And we're breaking down the hamburger that was just eaten. So now those little black bits and circles there in the animation, those are the remains of the hamburger. They've entered the small intestine, and they slowly get absorbed in, uh, and converted into glucose. And that G for glucose is stored in our kidneys. And so this is, again, part of our metabolism. And as we go about our day, our kidneys will release glucose whenever our levels get low. And that'll give us a jolt of energy to go about our day. So again, that's just an example of how humans control our metabolism. So the next thing I want to mention are the two big broad categories of how life on Earth uses energy. And the first category I want to mention are called autotrophs. And these organisms create sugars using energy from the sun. So in my animation, sunlight is striking this leaf. And then the cells of the leaf are creating sugars and in the process giving off oxygen. I hope you know I'm referring to the process called photosynthesis. So examples of organisms that are photosynthetic, autotrophs, include plants, the most obvious example, and then also algae. Let's not forget, plants are not the only organisms that do photosynthesis. They're probably just the most common ones that we think of. When we look at these two pictures right here, we have some common flowering plants on the bottom, but the top picture is a microscopic image of organisms called diatoms, and these are examples of algae. So again, the reason I'm showing this is just to show you that not uh, that, that plants are not the only organisms that do photosynthesis. What about the other category? The other category of, of, of organisms that use energy on Earth are called heterotrophs, and they're kind of just the opposite. If autotrophs do photosynthesis, then heterotrophs do not. They can't do photosynthesis. In fact, they consume others whenever they need energy. And so uh, fungus and, and animals are great examples of this. In the top picture, we have a wolf consuming something. And in the bottom picture, we have the skeletal remains of a cow's head. And again, um, that's just to, uh, to symbolize decomposing fungus and bacteria that helped to decompose the dead cow and leave behind basically just the skull and the horns. So autotrophs do photosynthesis and capture sunlight to make their food. Heterotrophs don't. Heterotrophs simply consume others. All right, so a third characteristic that all life on Earth possesses is the ability to respond to the environment. So we're all faced with various examples of a stimulus, which are environmental factors. You know, just watching this YouTube video, there are various stimuli that you're being exposed to. You're being exposed to the visual stimuli of the images changing. You're being exposed to the audio, the sound stimuli as I'm talking. And so we are all constantly receiving information and uh, it, which is causing our body to change in some way. You know, in the picture, 
Here at Living in Los Angeles, I swear, I see people using their cell phones at the most ridiculous of times. I've been bowling and I've watched people bowl while holding a cell phone in their hand. Well, in this picture, we have someone being careless and watch what they do. They accidentally drop a bowling ball on their foot. Notice how that will start a little chemical reaction. It's going to start a little signal in the person's foot. And that signal is going to travel up the person's brain. The brain is going to receive that little pain signal and ultimately the brain will send another message back to the foot causing you to jump away and probably set off, let off a few cuss words. But a uh, touch and pressure is a great example of a stimulus. Life responds to changes in temperature, changes in sound, uh, changes in pressure, changes in the amount of oxygen. Life responds to these features. And another life characteristic that all life possesses is life has the ability to reproduce and develop. My animation here shows a DNA molecule because that's really what reproduction passes along. Reproduction, no matter how much it's been glorified in, in, uh, in our society at least, reproduction simply passes genetic material, passes DNA from one generation to the next. That's really when you strip away all of the all of the ways that sex has been glorified in our culture, that's really all reproduction is, is the passing of genetic material from one generation to the next. Well, there's two ways in reproducing here on Earth, two types of reproduction. One is called asexual, and that means they can reproduce without having sex. So when you look at these two pictures here, we see the top picture is an amoeba and the bottom picture are bacteria. These are examples of organisms that reproduce asexually. Like it says in the notes, organisms that reproduce asexually, the offspring, the children, the babies, the offspring that are created are genetically identical to the parent. Basically, asexual reprodu reproduction creates copies or clones of the parent. Examples of organisms that can reproduce asexually. There's a lot here on Earth. Bacteria, which is sim uh, shown in the bottom picture. Protista, which is the top picture. An amoeba is an example of a protista. Some fungus, some plants, and even some animals can reproduce asexually. In this little animation here, here we have a bacteria cell growing and now splitting in half and becoming two bacteria cells. So bacteria are, can, can literally just split themselves into two and reproduce without the help of a second individual. In this picture right here, we have an example of a small organism that lives in the water called hydra. Hydra are, are, are relatives of jellyfish. And you can see this is an example of what's called budding. In the bottom right hand area of the picture, you can see a new hydra is beginning to bud and will eventually pop off of the original parent. So budding is a great way that some animals can reproduce asexually. When we look at uh, the, the second type of reproduction, sexual reproduction, offspring, babies, offspring that are made, they're a genetic mixture of two parents. Here we have two beetles uh, caught in the middle of having sex with one another in order to pass the genetic material on to the next generation. And so when you look at organisms that reproduce sexually, most fungus, most plants, most animals fit this description. When we look at plants, Here's a little a animation of a plant. The red dots inside of the plant represent pollen. Here comes a bumblebee flying around. And the bumblebee, we've all seen bumblebees, you know, go from plant to plant. Well, notice how that bumblebee had red pollen all over it at the end. And then it flew away. Let's follow that bumblebee. Where did it go? Here comes the bumblebee. It's flying. Look, it's got pollen all over it. And as it flies around another flower, it will leave pollen behind, and that's how plants can often reproduce sexually. Pollination is the process of spreading pollen from one flower to another. That's how plants reproduce sexually. 
So now that we've gone over some of the features that all life has in common, let me ask you, here's a list on the right, those very features we just discussed. Let me ask you, is fire alive? You know, if we were in class, I'd give you 30 seconds to discuss this with your neighbor, but pause the video. I'm going to go over the answers in, to these five questions in three, two, one. Is fire made of cells? No, of course not. Uh, fire can burn cells, but fire is simply a, a, a reaction of molecules and gases. Number two, does fire require energy? Yes, absolutely. Uh, some kind of combustible material is needed for fire. Number three, does fire respond to the environment? Yes, fire uh, behaves and responds very differently in different altitudes and different temperatures and different moisture conditions. Number four, can fire reproduce? Well, probably not like, you're, like we're used to thinking about reproduction, but asexually, yes. Let's say you have a fire burning and a spark lands uh, in a patch of dry grass that could start a second fire. And number five, will fire grow and develop? I'm going to say yes. You know, forest fires don't begin as forest fires. A forest fire begins when some jerk throws a cigarette butt out the window of their car. So when you look at these, the answer to this question should be obvious. Is fire alive? That should be an obvious answer. No. Even though fire has some things in common with life, I hope we're not going to call fire a living, uh, a living organism. Well, there's a lot of objects that have a few things in common with life. That doesn't mean it's living. Here's another example. So here's another example. Are cars alive? By the way, the picture shows my favorite car of all time, a Shelby Cobra. So ask yourself, yeses, yes or no to these five questions. Are cars alive? First of all, number one, are cars made from cells? Well, not the entire car, but yes, some parts are, especially if you have leather interior. For instance, the leather interior is from the skin of a cow. So yeah, that's very, that part is made from cells. Not the entire car, but, you know, parts of it. Number two, do cars require energy? At several, several, several dollars per gallon, I think we all know the answer to that question is yes. Number three, will cars respond to their environments? Depending on the car, absolutely. There's especially the, the more technologically advanced cars with traction control and anti-locking brakes and the ability to... Uh, change and stiffen the suspension when it encounters slippery roads. So yeah, more technologically advanced cars absolutely will respond to different driving conditions differently. Number four, will a car reproduce? No. Cars are of course assembled. Number five, will a car develop? No. They're assembled by people or an assembly line of machines. So ask yourself, are cars alive? I hope that's an obvious answer that no. Just because an inanimate object like a car has a few things in common with life, no, we're not going to call a car a living organism. So in order to be considered a living organism, it has to have all of these. So there you go. There's our, our what is biology uh, notes right there. Go ahead and pause the video. And if you're in my class, answer these questions on a separate sheet of paper. I'd be happy to check yourself for accurate. I'd be happy to check your answers for accuracy either before school or after school one day. Go ahead and pause the video. Good luck.